I thought it best to get proper perspective on everything. We go back in time a little bit. This is Blue Ridge Reservoir. I think the year of our incident there, the first one was uh, either 1998 or 1999 during the summer or early spring. Blue Ridge is a deep canyon lake. They made a dam there back in 1961 or 62. They're damming up Clear Creek proper. It resembles a river because from the dam you've got water that goes back about seven miles in one direction and water that goes back uh, up to five miles in high water in another direction. So it's a lot like paddling on a river. It's a really, really deep canyon lake. You climb up these ridges to the top, you better have a half a day's hike in mind because they're really high up there. I've often gone to the top of one ridge, thought I was at the very top and look up and there's something up above it yet. It's a really difficult place to travel as far as foot travel goes. My friend Christian and I took a trip back to Blue Ridge probably in uh, 98 or 99. Looked at both ends of the lake, I mean we were looking for bear sign, it was a particularly uh, dry spring and we've had problems with bears there before and I remembered a 10 by 15 rock that stuck out of the water at lower water and uh, we went looking for that and we found it and we set up camp there, a tent, a couple of chairs, a little barbecue and we tied the canoe off to the side of the rock fairly comfortable, I had to be a little bit careful not to fall overboard the rock wasn't that big We had probably turned in around 10 o'clock or so, and uh, I have the tendency to snore, and uh, Christian had <laughs> thrown everything in the tent he could at me. I woke up with shoes on my chest and beer cans on my chest, and uh, pretty much anything he could throw at me to get me to stop snoring. And uh, when I woke up, I asked him why he threw all this stuff on me, he said, because you were making a lot of noise snoring, but that's not a problem now. Listen. And, and I heard it coming out of the back canyon, uh, just a horrible shrill. And it would kind of just roll across the water out of the back canyon. And it sounded as if it was traveling and coming closer. And it was. And you could hear it coming through the woods up on the ridge above us and snapping limbs and trees as it came. And it was screaming the whole time. When it finally got on the ridge above us, the first thing it did was launch a 3 by 5 rock just missing my canoe, and we had just enough moonlight and starlight to see that coming. And it made a huge splash, and uh, my canoe started bouncing against the side of the rock, so we had this thing up there screaming, the shrill scream, and uh, uh, the added audio of, of my aluminum canoe banging on the side of the rock. And uh, as we were watching this thing, it, it started picking up forest debris, uh, pine cones, needles, pine needles, um, whatever forest debris could get its hands on and, and launching it at us. And we couldn't make out what the figure was, and, and Christian said, it's a banshee. They, a banshee's travel through the treetops at incredible speeds, and they have big long nails and rip you apart, rip you into shreds. My friend Christian was uh, so taken by the experience out there, he went home and drew the Blue Ridge Banshee. I was having suspicions that it was more like some type of uh, Bigfoot creature run amok. <laughs> I, I wasn't really sure. I, I didn't know. Um, it was definitely an experience, you know, and it, we can only really get the greasy shape and outline of the figure up on the ridge. We couldn't really get a, a really good eyeball on what was going on as far as what it looked like exactly, but it seemed to be fairly large and uh, throwing debris at us. 
We'd returned to Blue Ridge uh, several more times without any real incident, Christian and myself and uh, others. Um, the rock clicking there is is almost a constant. Um, it's like crickets, you know, you, you you drown them out. But some of the corners you'll go around in Blue Ridge, the rock clicking is almost a constant. Uh, I think at one point I point up at the ridge and I say, uh, there's some more of that rock clicking. <laughs> We spent New Year's uh, down at Apache Lake. It's just south of the uh, Mogollon Rim, and there's uh, several connecting lakes. You've got uh, Canyon Lake, um, I believe Sorrow Lake, several other lakes. Um, it's the Salt River dammed up, is what it is, and uh, they provide irrigation to uh, Phoenix proper. We'd spent quite a bit of time there. We spent New Year's there with a paddle club, and. Uh, decided to stay on. It was kind of cold up north and uh, the weather was pretty nice down there. And uh, we spent a total of seven days. I'd done a lot of uh, fishing. I was with my daughter and her mother, my youngest daughter. And uh, every night we'd make a campfire and do the campfire thing, you know. And uh, one evening, it must have been probably around, oh, say seven, seven o'clock at the latest. All the, the coyotes, uh, a nightly ritual, about dark 30, and they would pipe up, and uh, I didn't get much thought to it. And they were fairly close this evening uh, behind our camp. We were in tents. And um, one particular coyote seemed to pipe up above all the others as if he was being funneled through uh, a loudspeaker system. I mean, this thing was loud. And all the other coyotes shut up and almost all the people who were making racket uh, as far as camping uh, fairly near to us turned their music off or down to listen to this thing. And when it finished doing its coyote howl, it ended with like a wah 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 It's like a hyena or it was just bizarre and very, very loud. I didn't know what to make of it at the time. It really didn't. It was early April, Shudd had seen something up on Tease Mountain. That's Tease Mountain to your left there. He saw it walk up the, the knoll, and uh, he was perceiving it as a man on horseback. It was, it was very large. And it jumped down on to the ledge below immediately. It's uh, about a 10-foot drop. We went up there to check it out. Um, it's a two-track road up to the top. Pretty hard-packed ground. A really good commanding view of the valley. If, if I was foraging for food and wanted to get a look at what was, you know, down below, this would be the place to take a look. And uh, there's just one patch of green going through on the arroyo in an adjoining wash, um, which would afford very good cover as it did. What we found unusual up there, there was two transmitter antennas and a battery box, and um, they were about seven foot tall, these transmitters, and um, we looked around, got some footage up there, that's the uh, Carrizo Mountains in the background, and we could hear a vehicle coming up this two-track road, and uh, I said, uh, it's time to leave. In fact, the people down in the valley, directly below Tees Mountain, were yelling something up at us. We weren't sure what they were saying, but they sounded rather agitated. So on the way out, we met up with a guy in a white Chevy truck, said he was with BLM out of uh, Window Rock, and they were doing a town analysis and was asking us what we were doing up there. And we said, uh, uh, just taking pictures. We live down in the valley below. And we took kind of a different road down, which brought us right into this small little settlement at the base of the mountain. And we found it unusual that there was probably 15 individuals at home at the time during a weekday, a school day, a work day. They were all home and most of them were outside and we had to basically drive through the yard. I'm sure they were wondering what the heck we were doing. Before I'd left the reservation uh, early in May, uh, about five in the morning I was getting ready for work and I went outside and I, I heard what I thought pots banging, like rhythmically banging down uh, 
in the Tammy. So when I got home, I told Shed about it, and we, we went down there and investigated. And uh, we've been doing some stuff up on the river also, about a mile 10, you know, but uh, it seemed things were closer to home. Uh, it was really weird to hear the pots banging. I shined down there, I, I didn't see anything. So when I got back, we uh, immediately went down into the uh, Tammy beds. That's definitely been laying down through here too. Laying down in here, right here too. Little ways in and out everywhere. <clears throat> Get down on all fours and get out. Back here's neat. Interesting. Oh, yeah. Here's there's, there's crunching around. Here's a big pond way down the top. He was looking through the hands, and he thought they were stirrups on a saddle. That's how big his hands were. And uh, he just kind of stood up there motionless for a little bit, and then he started to move a little bit. And you could very visibly, with even the naked eye, with the wind blowing on him, you could see his fur, his hair blowing in the wind. And then he stood sideways, and that cast out all doubt about it being anything other than a large bipedal, person around 14 or 15 feet tall and I'm judging this because the portable transmitter antennas were still up on the mountain at the time and he was twice as tall as those antennas and uh, even with a pronounced slouch um, it, it appears he has some type of back problem because he walks with a slouch and uh, follow up sightings of him all report a slouch. We kept fighting over the binoculars for just a couple of minutes. I just needed one good look and I was convinced of what I was seeing. And uh, Shut finally got to see one and uh, he was really excited. And at this time we're still just blown away. And I wanted to keep him in sight longer. So 
I had the wind at my back, and I raised my arm and started waving, and I went, hi, yo, really loud. And then he backed away from the knoll, and I was afraid we'd frightened him, and he was leaving. But much to our surprise, he came around on the left-hand side there, and he hooked up with the road, and he started walking down the road. Um, and we were watching his progress. At one point, he stumped down and, and covered his uh, his face with his arm, and he kind of squatted down, and he just looked like a, a big black blob. At, the, at one point, he left the road, and he cut down a ravine, and he was heading right for us. And the neighbors on the mesa above us, uh, we heard a woman scream. And a, a man yelled something to her, like, oh, did you see that? Real loud. And I ran into my little house, and instead of coming out with a camera, I came out with a rifle and pulled the bolt back. And we waited, and he went right down into the Tammy stand. 40 yards from us, and our dogs were going insane, yet the neighbor lady, whom we suspect has been feeding this individual we've uh, named Joe, her dogs walk single file down the fence with their tails in the air, happy as if they're going to see an old friend, and they went right down into the tanning beds, and I'm sure they had a little visit with Joe. And about five minutes later, they, they came back out, walked the fence line, tails in the air, really happy, while our dogs were still going insane. At that time, I sent those neighbor children home and uh, told them to lock their doors and wait for their parents to come home. Unbeknownst to us, while this was going on, uh, another one of the neighbors had come home, and she reported the next day that she had seen a tree swinging back and forth in the tanning beds was no wind, and uh, she wouldn't have had she wouldn't have had any idea of this type of activity. Uh, this person has no interest in this phenomenon. Shud and I continued with our barbecue, you know, keeping an eye on the Tammies, not knowing what to expect, and knowing well that we had a visitor down there. Uh, as we've known in the past, there was something down there we just couldn't see it. It was well hidden in the uh, heavy Tammies stands and uh, I made it till about 9.30 and I went to bed and uh, Colton the neighbor <laughs> against what I told him snuck back over and sat up was shut by the fire and he said I, I just want to see it again and uh, really nothing unusual other than uh, probably around 11 they heard a really loud moan growl howl as if something had disturbed it while it was sleeping, you know, maybe maybe one of the neighbor lady's dogs had come down and bothered him. And that was about it for that night. Um, ongoing activity, more than I can talk about here and now. Um, ongoing activity there even now. I keep returning to this area with other researchers we watched the mountain, and I think effectively what probably got Joe's curiosity up about us was Shut and I initially going down into the Tammy bed. Um, that would be his living room of sorts because uh, him and they sleep down there after they basically raid the valley. We've witnessed one raid about 1 o'clock in the morning. Up to three individuals came through our field stepped right over the fence and they grabbed the dog dish out of the neighbor's front yard and went around to the back of their house and you could hear the loud crunching sounds. That same evening I heard a chimpanzee type scream with chest pounding at the same time which was somewhat unnerving. Uh, outside of the zoo or television I've never heard this uh, first hand uh, really interesting and unnerving at the same time. Definitely a, a primate sound. And we listened as these uh, individuals went up from the neighbors. They went up to uh, Grandma's house.
across the Arroyo, the little river that runs through, and they worked their way down the valley, and then they worked their way back into our uh, tamarisk stand right down below our property. This was a subsequent visit uh, back in October. I caught some movement by this rock, and I believe that's Joe just sitting against the rock, and we're looking at him sideways. And uh, he's really good at playing possum. You can catch some movement, and then he'll just freeze um, and or lay down. I'm going to set up for this video. It's about six minutes of video coming up. And what's happening here is uh, a friend and I had just gone down into the Tammy beds. And the big mistake I made is I should have been running video when we went down there. Because Carlos, my friend, was standing up watching the mountain with uh, some very good binoculars. And while we were in the Tammy beds, about a minute into our little descent down into them, uh, he started yelling, It's a dinosaur. It's huge. It's a raptor. Uh, he couldn't... <laughs> it was all very striking to him, and not at all what he expected. And Joe basically stood up, walked toward us. I think he was looking down into the tanning beds. And that's when Carlos caught the movement and, and zoomed in on him and uh, got a pretty good look at him. And he walked a few steps toward us and he had the protruding, the, the slouch, the very noticeable slouch. And perhaps that's what made Carlos at first say he was seeing a raptor. And then he turned around and walked away from us. And he lay down alongside this rock. In the subsequent video that's going to follow here, it's about six minutes. And there's going to be a lot of noise and wind and so forth. But you're going to hear me and my friend were walking back down into the tammy beds and hoped that he'll get up again out of curiosity. Of course he doesn't. He lays against this rock and it's the dark rock. You see the circle there. It's the dark rock near the white lettering to the right of the circle in the picture. And he's just laying there playing possum. But you'll hear Carlos say he's looking at me I can see a head looking at me and that's about all he did for the next hour when we got back up from the tammy beds watching taking turns watching him all he would do is cock his head over a little bit as far as anything else he he lay motionless we're active let's go so just leave it there yep he's gonna get up again you got to point it directly at it? Yeah. You look at the zoom finder. I can see a head. Just watching me. I can definitely see a head.
this nice sandy spot to camp. We probably only made it about 10 or 12 miles that first day. We had been uh, celebrating with family in Tisnos Post. I got kind of a late start. This uh, picture would be from about sunset of that first day. We gathered a lot of firewood to get a big raging fire going. It was still fairly early in the season. It was going to be a fairly cold night. It was a fairly quiet evening, other than some strange things floating down the river. We couldn't really make them out. Um, might have been beavers swimming and or otters. Uh, we just got a lot of eye shine, small eye shine, uh, as these things uh, swam or floated past us. I had taken note of the fact that Grady had not put a, a rain fly on his tent, and I, I, I said, well, do you really want to see something peering in on you? And he says, ah, don't worry, I have flash photography. It was a fairly quiet evening, other than the wind had started to pick up, and unfortunately, uh, the weather forecast for that next day was going to give us 40 and 50 mile per hour gusts trying to navigate this river. I'm still unclear as to what time of the night or early morning the uh, our visitor came near our camp within 30 feet of our camp. Um, it was really hard to tell that night with the wind whipping around as it was if anything had entered our camp. It was that next morning after coffee, uh, Grady went off to relieve himself in the tammy beds and uh, he had found this track and immediately called it to my attention. And on either side of the track, um, there was just where we drug the firewood out. Um, had it visited the uh, night before, it's quite likely that uh, our firewood dragging wiped out any more tracks. This was the only really clear one we could get. Um, that's Grady's barefoot at the top of the picture. He's a uh, size 11. Um, that's his sandal print next to it, size 11. And uh, what I'm pretty sure is a Sasquatch track. I'm going to wrap this section up here. Uh, this is a track from uh, Tisno Spose in March 2006. Near the track was a, a twist broke tree I, I neglected to take a picture of, but it's still very obviously there and <laughs> broken. I'll get a picture later. There's so much more to tell. There's so much more to show. My daughter came home late one night from the neighbor's house and she saw a figure looming uh, above these bone barrels uh, at least twice the height of Shutter, that's him behind the burn barrels and <laughs> she ran in the house screaming um, they come down they come down looking for food opportunities without a doubt, especially Joe I, I think Joe is really acclimated to the area if, if not fearless I so wish Shutt was here now to see all we've seen. He would just be so ecstatic. We don't know why he took his life entirely.